All right. Thank you, Caitlin. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, we're going to take a look at Microsoft Dynamics GP 2018. Um, I will say kind of before we get going, this is kind of based on the assumption that you have not seen Dynamics GP ever. Uh, so if if you are uh, already a user or you've used it in the past, um, that's fine. You're uh, more than welcome to stay and, and please do because you might see some things hopefully that you haven't seen before. Even if you're running Dynamics GP 2018, you might see some things that you haven't seen before. But you might see some things that you know of and you might say, oh, well, that's not a GP 2018 feature. That's been there for 20 years. Uh, yes, that's true. But um, we're, we kind of do these for people that uh, typically have not seen the product. So just keep that in mind. And um, I've got about four or five slides here. So we'll get going. We're not going to spend too much time with slides because this is a product tour. Um, but let me kick it off here. And so if you are going to run uh, GP 2018, in your environment, there uh, of course are always some system requirements that are important to uh, make sure that you have. And so the biggest thing here is um, your desktop machines where GP is installed um, really run on any current version of Windows. So Windows 7 to 10, so 7, 8, 8.1 and 10 are all perfectly fine. So nothing uh, really new there. Um, on the uh, server side, there it is. Um, it, it is able to run in a virtual environment, and that's how most people have their servers set up today. Uh, Microsoft, of course, supports their own virtualization software called Hyper-V. Um, uh, coincidentally, uh, this really will run on any virtualized system. And so Hyper-V, some people use. Uh, Microsoft, of course, uh, likes to, to support their own, but if you use VMware or uh, really anything else, I personally have not seen it run on, uh, on any kind of virtualization system. And so um, the, the, the official supported product is Microsoft, but unofficially and, and logically it runs on, on any kind of virtualized server. Uh, if you're going to do PDF uh, work inside of Dynamics GP, so if you're going to create PDFs, uh, again, the official supported product is Adobe uh, 10 or Adobe X, as some people call it. Um, it. It runs equally as well with most of the free, like a cute PDF or, um, you know, there's probably 30 or 40 of them out there. I always tell people, knowing that the supported version is one you have to pay for, download a free one. If you get stuck someplace that it doesn't work, well, then you might have to do Adobe. But for the most part, the, the free ones seem to work okay. And then if you're running Microsoft Office, which most people are today, uh, Office 2013, Office 2016 uh, are supported. It doesn't mean if you have an older version of Office, it won't work. It's just there could be one or two features that don't work very well uh, in the older version. So you want to be somewhat current. Um, SQL Server side of things, um, GP 2018 does take advantage of the newer versions of SQL, and so you would want to be on SQL 2014, 16, or 17. Uh, 2014 is, I think, set to end support here later this year, maybe uh, October, November timeframe. Um, Microsoft could extend that, but as of right now, I think 2014 is going to go off support. So if this is something you're going to buy, I probably wouldn't buy 2014 just because um, it uh, it could be obsolete here in a few months. So you probably want to stick with 2016 or the brand new 2017. And then finally, if you are a current GP user, um, uh, there, there's not a direct path from some of the older versions. And if you've been on GP for a while, you probably know that uh, if you get too far back. So if you're on, on a version that's uh, a little bit old, sometimes you have to make a, a, a more than one jump or more than one hop to get current if you upgrade. Um, but if you're on GP 2013, that's kind of where the break is. You can't go from 13 or older to 18. 
but you can go from 15 and 16 to 18, and I put the exact versions down there that you would want to be on to actually make the jump to 2018. And, and if you're on GP 2015, but on a, a, a version that's slightly older than the 0 .0898 there, which is the 2015 year end, then you would have to service back your 2015 to something uh, 0898 or later um, to get to 2018. And so um, not a big deal. That's stuff we do every day, all day. Um, but just keep in mind that, um, you know, if you if you are a GP user today, uh, you know, sometimes people will uh, say, well, I'm not going to upgrade to every version. I'm going to wait a few, which is perfectly fine. And lots of people do that. But when you do upgrade, you still have to go through the steps. And so you, you may or may not be saving time or money by, by skipping. But, uh, you know, of course, we realize that you don't want to do an upgrade every year type thing that's somewhat disruptive or can be. And so um, usually if you're a version or two back, you're OK. So in this case, 15, 16 are good to go to 18 uh, when GP, whatever the next version comes out. If it'll be GP 2019 or 2020, um, you know you you probably don't want to still be sitting on GP 2013, and so then you start to get uh, multiple versions back. So anyway, with that said, we'll close down the slides and spend the rest of the time here in the product. And let me move that over to the screen. Okay, it's fighting me here. There we go. All right. Uh, and so this is Dynamics GP 2018. I'm logged in as the system administrator. So keep that in mind as we go through this. I don't have any security being applied. So A, everything is unlocked. Uh, in real systems, that's generally not always the case, other than maybe a few users in a company. Most people do have security where they can only see and do certain things. But uh, today for this presentation, there's no restrictions on what I can see. And I also should point out, I have a lot of modules installed. And so um, things that we probably won't have a chance to talk about today. But uh, in your system, you may not see as many choices on your menus. Uh, if you're not using project accounting, for example, or if you're not using payroll and human resources or field service, you won't see those things show up on your menus, um, but you'll see those things on mine. So when a user logs in, they land on what Microsoft calls uh, is our homepage here. And you can see up here on the left, it says SA's homepage, so system admin. Uh, home page that would normally say your name and on my home page I can configure it and add things in on those things that I have uh, need of and those things that I do on a regular basis and so as I go into the customize here you can see I've got uh, some simple check boxes uh, I have most everything installed with the exception of the connect um, tool here and uh, so that's kind of up to you and we all will have different home page configurations based on what we do and in our needs and so none of our home pages would probably look identical and then you have a little bit of flexibility on how you want the system to look and so i have my home page set in two columns so you can see a left and a right column there i could squeeze that down to three columns i could make it one big column which pushes everything uh, kind of stacks it up so it would push it down i'd have to scroll down and um, find all the different components that I had on my page. Um, and then um, if I do kind of change the focus of the page, which you'll see here in a couple of minutes, um, I just tell the system, where do I want the, the unfocused tiles to go? And I have mine set to go off to the right. And so just um, keep in mind that you do have pretty good flexibility on how your page looks and how it responds. And so, the page uh, based on those components that I have brought in, um, of course, I can rearrange it. So, you know, I can drag and drop the tiles around. I don't have to uh, have it the way that it displays here. Um, but uh, the first tile up in the uh, top left here is kind of my to-do area. And these are the things that I either have the system set to remind me of or someone else has reminded me of. And so... Uh, you'll see here I have a task uh, that someone put on my page to make sure I deposit the vending machine cash today. And we'll just take a look at uh, the task here. And so 
I can open that task up and it's been assigned uh, to me, so I created it and assigned it to myself. But you'll notice if you have security that you could actually create a task and give it to someone else to do. Now, somebody asked uh, one time, well, could I just give my whole job to someone else and and uh, you know do online gambling all day? Well, uh, <laughs> it's not really for us to answer, but uh, probably not. Um, but you do have the ability to create tasks and assign those tasks out to other users. So if you're going to be gone maybe tomorrow and you want somebody to, uh, in, in my example here, to make sure they deposit the vending machine cash or to make sure a certain customer paid or a vendor got a call back or paid or something, you could certainly do that inside of the system. Kind of like sending an Outlook um, email or putting something on someone's Outlook calendar. It kind of functions the same way, but this is contained inside of GP, and so this, these tasks do not show up on your Outlook calendar. Um, if you need to send a link to someone, maybe you want to send them a link to the GP window that you want them to uh, check on. So maybe if it's a vendor payment that needs to go out, you send them a link to that. Uh, if it's a web page or an Excel file or something out, a Word document or something else out on your a network drive and you want to send um, a link as part of the task, you could do that. And then if they complete that task, they could come in and mark it completed. And of course, it would put the date and timestamp on there. And so you have a little bit of um, uh, some light management of what's happening in the system here right on your home page. I don't have any workflow tasks yet, but when we look at the requisition here in a couple of minutes, I will uh, have a workflow task that shows up um, where I'm uh, uh, prompted to approve a requisition that someone sent me. Uh, and then the reminder area, this really is maybe one of the more powerful parts of the system. And so in the reminder section, we're actually getting the software to um, figure out when something is, when a condition exists, and uh, and then tell the user or users that that condition's out there. And so I have a number of reminders uh, set up here. I've got one uh, customers over their credit limit. And so I can drill down on that and you'll see that it said that there was seven there. And so these are all hyperlinks down into the data. And when I click on that reminder, it opens our little query tool here called SmartList. And this is really just an ad hoc query tool. Um, uh, you know, there's a number of reports that we have available, uh, depending on the modules you're using. Could be several thousand reports that are available to you. But uh, sometimes, you know, Microsoft can't build everything that, that everybody needs. And so they do give us the tools to get to the data the way that we want it and kind of when we want it and, and how we want it to look and so forth. And so here I see the customers over the credit limit. And uh, sure enough, I've got some credit limit numbers here and, and the system has pulled out what the actual customer balance is. And so I've obviously let these people go over their credit limit. And so um, I, could, uh, uh, I could view this, which is what I'm doing. Of course, I could uh, print this off if I wanted to uh, send this out to uh, the printer for some reason or export it out to a file. Um, I have the ability, because it is a customer area, I have the ability to use Microsoft Word and to prepare a letter to these customers. And so maybe maybe I'm going to increase their credit limit since I've obviously let them uh, overspend already. And so um, there's about 40 or 50 letters that come with the system. Of course, you'll see the common thread or the common rule here is we can create unlimited of our own. We don't have to, um, we're, we're never stuck with what Microsoft does. They just give us uh, stuff that's fully functional. But a lot of people edit these letters just like you would edit a report to your own liking. Um, a lot of people create their own letters and so based on these templates or from scratch. So there is an adjustment to the credit limit that uh, Microsoft uh, sends us, but you'll see I've got another one that I put new on and, and that's one that I just copied and created my, or edited myself. So I'm going to use that one. And uh, these are the customers that are going to get this letter saying, hey, we're going to bump your credit limit. Well, you know, maybe I'm still kind of debating on these guys, so I won't do a letter to them right now. Uh, so I'll just do these five that I've selected. And then how do we want those letters uh, to be signed? And so when I click finish, the system will do a little mail merge between the template and the accounting data, and I'll get five of these letters. And so there they are. And so I've made uh, a simple edit to this um, 
uh, template, and that was I added this logo up here in the left-hand corner. So um, Microsoft leaves room there for your logo, and, and of course my company inside of the Dynamic System is called Fabricam, and so that would normally pull your company information there. But um, but other than that, I really didn't do any edits at all to the body of the letter. Uh, I simply added the logo, and so. These are very easy to personalize and make your own. And of course, once these are over in Word, uh, they're Word documents. And so anything that you would normally do if you want to, uh, you know, change this up and um, uh, type in anything uh, that you like here um, on one of the letters, you can do that. And so these these are fully functional Word documents and, and all the functionality of Word is available uh, for you. And so once you have these, of course, uh, you know, you do have to get these out to the customers. And so you could print these and mail them or fax them or if you're going to scan them and email them or however you normally communicate with the customer, um, you would pick that up from here. But uh, this system does the, the mail merge between the Dynamics data and the Word template. And so uh, that's a simple example of using the accounting data with the Microsoft Office products, pretty much seamless there. If I go back and kind of look behind the scenes, you'll see I have a number of views here or of folders that I can get into. And, and again, keep in mind, I have full security to all of this, so not everybody will see everything. But maybe, uh, you know, I want some hardcore accounting data. And so uh, very quickly, I just, um, with a few clicks, I can extract out what would look more like general ledger data. And uh, this is a lot of data in, in a lot of different uh, time frames here. So really what I might be looking for is, um, uh, let's just take this December of 2023. And so I might use the search feature and decide I want to limit that data to a particular period. And so uh, here's my transaction date. And I could say any number of um, search criteria here. So I might say is between, and we'll say 12-10-2023, uh, and maybe 12-30-2023. So I'm looking for something or some transactions that might be within that date. And of course, um, the search tool never lies. It's There aren't any. And so I'll go back and uh, expand this up to 12-31. And so that's probably where everything is sitting. And of course, there it is. And so once I come up with uh, whatever the data is that I might want to extract, of course, this has the Excel functionality. So built in, if I wanted to sort this, maybe I was looking for a particular debit or credit amount in the general ledger. Um, you could print a paper copy and go through you know pages and pages and pages and waste a lot of time but it's much easier to just use this uh, type of functionality to um, uh, easily extract the data and then manipulate it and so uh, well you know I might want to do something in Excel with this and so I'm not really looking for a report so to speak but I want to do some kind of slicing and dicing of the data and so once I have kind of queried out what I'm looking for I could use the Excel uh, option here and with one click the system uh, creates a nice Excel temp um, or worksheet here for me not a template but a worksheet and uh, of course, I have my decimals set up to five when I export, so most people don't, but just to illustrate that uh, we can uh, get a little bit more precise if we wanted to. And so the same rule uh, applies here as what it did in Word is this is Excel at this point. So if I uh, you know, want to do anything um, in Excel that I would normally do, I have that ability. Of course, I could add my own columns here and do whatever I might want to do, but um, it's very, very quick and easy to get the data from the accounting system over into the Microsoft Office products, kind of where those hooks are. And so lots and lots of choices here, uh, lots of query tools, uh, pre-built uh, queries. Uh, uh, you know, here's all the vendor section. So uh, many, many things here, and, and, and this is very fast and easy to be able to change the data up and to extract the data that you want kind of in your own format. And so this isn't, um, uh, you know, the only reporting tool, but it is a pretty popular one that folks use. Okay, so that kind of uh, addresses that kind of tile. Uh, some of these will go a little faster because they don't have so much in them, but uh, moving over to the business analyzer, and I'm going to change the focus of my page, and if you remember in the page setup, I said, uh, you know, when I 
do that when I change the focus of my home page the columns that I'm not focused on I need those stacked over in my case on the right and so that's what you're seeing happening here is those are all being kind of pushed over to the right where I can get to uh, this particular area and so the business analyzer allows us to again another kind of reporting or uh, key performance indicator area business metrics um, and I have a number of those there's actually a couple hundred of those that come with the system and I see the available reports and and I have not done anything to these whatsoever uh, I've not made any edits um, I've not added any this is just what comes from Microsoft and you'll see I've got a number of those plugged into my home page here uh, for me to use and, and again I've got security to all of, of that data and so um, so types of charts and graphs and reports that are available in this area um, are things like this heat map where we can see um, in this case it's the the US we can see where my uh, sales commissions are taking place and so uh, by state and um, you know based on the uh, the states that are lit up here and the grid I can see kind of the ranges that I'm paying commissions in those particular areas here's another kind of depiction of uh, the accounting data in this case it's the top five customers based on what they've spent um, this year or what they bought uh, so far this year from my company um, total revenue detail well it says there's no data that's probably because my date is set for today and most of my data is up here in 2027 so if I change the date on that graph I see then um, my uh, revenue detail that's uh, that that looks like I started off the year uh, pretty good and uh, by April uh, you know not much is happening so luckily this is fictitious data another type of chart or graph in this case it's a, a speed dial and so also my data is up here in 2027 so there we go it flipped to the other side and so this uh, you know you can imagine if you wanted to give access to these to folks that they didn't need the exact um, dollars and cents they really just need to kind of see a picture of maybe what's happening they don't need to see every um, uh, penny that is flowing through there flowing through the system um, my cash will have some data here so let me fix this one so this just kind of give you an idea of the types of charts and graphs that we have available or Microsoft has pre-populated in the system um, and and this is raw data so it's not a chart but it's kind of summarized raw data um, and uh, there's a pie chart of my top five customers um, and there my heat map is finished populating here these do take a few seconds to actually load up when I request them because it has to go get the data and massage the data from the database into the chart or the graph or the report and so uh, this uh, let's pick on this one here for a few seconds and so let me bring this up to date and so this is my cash position again um, you know if you're on the accounting side of things or or maybe even not you know, that doesn't look like a good graph a big red line sloping down towards uh, negative numbers so um, but you know you might say well I don't really need these because I can go look at the raw data I don't really need to see it in a graph and yeah that's probably true but the beauty of these reports is they're available uh, really anywhere and so if I open my browser here and um, uh, browse out to where these charts and graphs are sitting and again keep the security thing in mind that uh, I've got full access to all this so I've got two companies in my GP28 uh, system 2018 system and here's the company we're in today these are all the different folders where those reports and charts and graphs are stored and so if I go into my financial folder I've got a number of things here so I can run a trial balance if I want to right from the browser here um, I can go into charts and graphs and these are all the key performance indicators that I have available and let's see I think this is the one we're running back in my system and yes as of today there's nothing but if I set this up to my uh, date in my GP system and this you'll see just a couple of second delay there where it goes to actually get the data and so uh, here you can see that uh, I can read the accounting data and present that live uh, uh, directly in my GP system and so I'm actually running that same chart inside of the software but most people would actually look at that through their browser and and this runs in Internet Explorer Chrome 
uh, Firefox, so, you know, Safari, and so that the 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 reason being is we want to be able to show this on somebody's iPhone or iPad or Android phone when they're traveling. Maybe they're at a hotel, or you know, if the boss is on vacation, uh, she's still going to keep an eye on cash, no doubt, and maybe what sales are happening. And yeah, the old-fashioned way is to call the office and say, hey, what did we get in, you know, today, and who paid, and blah blah blah. And you can still do that if if you have the need. But a better way is to just become more self-sufficient and deliver these out to the people that need them on a self-serve basis and not have them bothering the accounting folks. And, you know, they might be in a different time zone. And so they call the, the office while everybody's gone. And so then they got to wait type thing. And that's all old school. Um, you know, some people still do it, but it is old school. Uh, you know, a more modern world is, is really just getting the data when you need it. And this is all real time from the ERP system. And so as transactions flow through, these charts and graphs are updated. It doesn't matter what device we're holding in our hand or sitting in front of, uh, we can use uh, anything, any iOS uh, version, any Android version, any Microsoft Windows version to actually um, be able to look at the data. Okay, so let me change the focus back now to the rest of our page here. So quick links in my reports are those things that I work on on a regular basis. So if I run uh, accounts payable, uh, and that's part of my job is to deal with vendors and payables, um, I've pulled onto my homepage um, the aging report. And so this is all of my open AP uh, for, uh, for today. So looking at current information. Um, so anything that's sitting out there that's unpaid to a vendor, um, I can pull up and see at any given point in time. And so and down at the bottom here, we've got some totals there on what I owe. So, um, you know, if, if uh, I have reports that I run frequently, I would normally just pull those onto my homepage. So with one click, that report can execute and uh, I don't have to remember where it was and click three or four or five times to get to it. Um, None of us need mouse practice uh, nowadays, so um, you know the the fewer the keystrokes and mouse clicks, the better off we are. So quick links is very similar. That's really the things that I work on on a regular basis. So not reports, but things that I am responsible for. So if I reconcile uh, the cash accounts, and most people do this uh, daily or weekly now, uh, hardly anybody waits to get the bank statement in the mail. Again, that's kind of an old older way of doing things and, and holds up the month in closing because we haven't reconciled. So, you know, uh, and if, if the mail is slow, um, then, then that uh, pushes our closing even farther. And so uh, most of our customers do daily or weekly reconciliations. Um, I've got one started here and, um, and, and the idea is you could still do these manually, although again, that's a lot of clicks. And so what most people have gone to is more of an electronic reconcile where we download the tran transactions from the bank that have uh, cleared through our account. And you know, if we do that daily or, or once a week, that's really up to us. And those transactions go into a file. We map that file over into the Dynamics GP system. And then uh, this uh, electronic reconcile feature will actually go through and match what's in the file with what's on my screen here. And so you'll see, as soon as I click yes here, you'll see that it's doing the electronic reconcile there for just a few seconds. And it's going through and kind of reading my fake file and ticking off those transactions that have cleared the bank and and again i can come in and and you know do manual things of course i might have some things that gp doesn't know about so maybe there's a service charge or uh, somebody gave me a bad check and so the banks reverse that out uh, you know, I might have a wire fee or earn some interest. And so, you know, sometimes I need to make adjustments uh, to my cash accounts right from the bank reconciliation. So we can do that uh, type of thing right here and put our GL account number there and, um, and handle that kind of all in one spot. This is kind of the first place we've seen the GL account number, and you'll notice that I'm kind of using a three digit, a four digit, and a two digit. Well, that's, um, just kind of my sample data here. So if I drill back on the account, um, the account that I have populated here is bank fees, but um, you'll see that, uh, you know, I, I'm using kind of this layout. The system does have room for 66 alphanumeric characters in the chart. I'd probably discourage you from getting anywhere near using 66, but that is a hard 
coded limitation in the system. I say limitation, but um, but that is the ceiling. And then there's room for nine dashes, so we can have 10 different segments. Now I'm using three segments. We can have up to 10 segments. And and again, uh, that's that's quite a few, but um, but that is kind of a ceiling on the number of breaks that we can have in our chart. And so there's uh, kind of a list of my accounts that I have in my company here. Um, Okay, so that's a quick and easy way to do bank reconciliations uh, that uh, a lot of people have gone to now where they're not trying to do it on a, a monthly basis and, and certainly not doing it by manually ticking off the clear transactions. Uh, other things um, that are pretty popular, um, certainly you have to make uh, entries into your general ledger from time to time. So here's the GL entry screen. Um, the red fields that you see kind of coming as I open these windows now, those I have turned on uh, mostly for your benefit. So you can see that those are the required fields on a particular window. So as you're learning the software, if you're gonna um, be in this particular window, the journal entry or transaction entry uh, screen, those red fields have to be filled out before you can actually finalize this uh, transaction. And so uh, obviously every window has different requirements and, um, and, and, and that's fine, that's expected. But, um, but in this case, I'd have to tell the system these five different things. Well, you see four of them are filled in for me. And so that makes it pretty easy. All I have to do is come in and say what my description is. Um, so we we'll make something up there and, uh, and, then, and then I'm ready for the entry. Um, you can make your own requirements. So you cannot subtract from what Microsoft's requirements are because that's for the database integrity. And so we need to capture the minimum things here, but you could turn other things on. So if you wanted someone, um, uh, this is Windows pretty basic, but some Windows that have a lot more going on. If you want to force people to capture certain data elements or points, you can turn things on uh, yourself that are required. Some people will turn those into a different color. Some people keep those red as well, or some people don't, you know, they might just make them bold or something, but that's really up to us. Um, uh, but that's why you see the, the colors on the window here. So, so, and okay, so I could come in and I could key uh, accounts in here. That's, uh, that's fine. And a lot of people still do that. But uh, another way to get data is uh, from Excel. And so here you'll see I've got just a simple Excel entry and um, with accounts and some debits and credits, well, at least one credit and a bunch of debits. And, um, and so if I've created something in Excel or I've done some kind of workup that uh, maybe I've done some calculations, bonuses or accruals at the end of the month or something, uh, many times you know we, we have all the data that we need and then we just need to get the entry. Well, if it's a couple of lines, yeah, you can probably key that pretty accurately and pretty quick. But you know, if you get a, a, a big entry here, well, nobody's really interested in, in rekeying that if they have the numbers kind of worked up somewhere else. And certainly you can always make a mistake with the account number or the dollar amount and waste time trying to find it. And uh, you know nobody's got that kind of time today. So everybody's pretty busy. So the idea here is if I do work something up in Excel and you know I could have uh, 50 tabs here that kind of create the, the numbers for me and, and, and I get down to a simple entry, but it might've taken weeks to actually get to the numbers uh, for the entry. So I can come in here and copy. So I've highlighted in copy just like I would in any Windows product. And uh, once I start a journal entry here, you'll notice I've got the Excel paste button. And so I can simply paste that right into Excel. And so there we go, we can see them side by side. And so, uh, you know, I can see uh, that, that the GP copy and paste has just lifted that up, just like any copy and paste and pasted that right into my journal entry window. Um, so now one thing that I wanna point out here is the very last three accounts in my entry um, are actually not financial accounts. These are not dollars and cents or debits and credits. These are unit accounts and unit accounts mean that I have the ability to track things that are not financial. And so if I go down here to the bottom and, and you might look at that, you might argue that that looks like it's a financial account. Well, yes it does. But uh, if I highlight this account and open it up, you'll see that this actually drills back to uh, a, a, a non-dollar kind of debit and credit account but instead back to the number of, in this case, telephones installed. Well, if I click on the lookup here and I see all the unit accounts that I have, 
Uh, I'm tracking things like square footage in this account that I've used, the number of telephones, the number of computers, um, number of headcount, so how many people are in a certain department. Uh, here we did uh, one for an amusement park where we're tracking the number of armbands that were sold every day. And, and so, well, why would we wanna do this? Well, if you think about financial reporting, we can pull all of this data into our financial reporting. So into our income statement or profit and loss, and you know, if we want to divide sales by daily armbands sold or uh, divide a certain cost by the number of computers in a department or by headcount, you know, in the retail business, square footage is a big thing. So they look at dollars uh, generated or dollars sold by square foot. And so um, we, we're, we're not limited to just dollars and cents. We can put unlimited unit accounts into the system as well. And, um, and, and what I've done here is actually bring in a number of those unit accounts. And so there's rent expense to allocate. We'll talk about that in a minute. And this one is um, probably utilities, utilities to allocate. And so um, I've combined that all up in one journal entry and uh, the software knows that some of these are dollars and cents, debits or credits. Some of these are units. And of course, they don't need an offset. So this is one time that debits and credits don't have to equal is when we're posting to these unit accounts. We don't have another side. So because they're not dollars and cents. And so, uh, but the beauty is that I can capture that. I can bring those in and the system takes those knowing based on my setup that, hey, I'm not looking for an offset to these final three accounts. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're not going to, uh, going to dollars, they're not going to the general ledger per se. And so these are just things that I'm tracking in addition to my financial um, dollars and cents here. And so I'll just uh, get rid of that. And so um, speaking of the allocations, there are two ways kind of out of the box to do allocations. One is fixed, and we saw an entry coming in to that copy and paste into a fixed allocation account. And uh, fixed meaning that uh, I want to allocate in this example rent uh, based on these certain percentages into these six different departments. And so um, every month when I post rent, the system's going to kind of reallocate that and post really based on my breakdown. And it's fixed here by these percentages until I come in and change it. And uh, so that's good, but not everything is fixed. And so here we have utilities, and these are going to be um, allocated based on not a fixed percent, but on a variable percent. And so as I highlight the first kind of department 100 in my example here, and I'm just using this first segment for department or division, uh, just as an example. And so here, um, the system doesn't know the percentage, it has to go somewhere else to determine it. And so when I look at the somewhere else account, the breakdown account, it's going to go to square footage. And so you see, I just have one entry in for my month of April here, period four. I haven't done the rest of the year. And so it's going to take the square footage for all the different departments, add those up, and then figure out how much from department 100, the 38 square foot, or this might represent 3,800. And it's gonna divide that by the total and figure out how much of the utility costs then to allocate to department or division or company 100. And so that's a variable allocation. And so lots and lots of options there. Um, uh, budgeting, uh, you'll see we have a number of budgets here. We can have unlimited budgets in the system for any period of time. And uh, we use, make very good use of Excel in creating uh, budgets. And so uh, I won't take the time to do one, but we can create a budget right from GP using Excel. And then we can bring that budget back into GP once we send that out to the different departments and folks, whoever might be responsible for creating the budget, they return those to us. We can come back into GP and import their budget back in and lock that down so that nobody can change it then. And, um, and then of course, pull that into the financial reporting system as well. And so some people will do a kind of a preliminary budget, a more final budget, and then an amended budget or two or 10 during the year, and then they might have a final budget. And so we can keep track of, of any or all of those that we want to and use those for uh, reporting throughout the year. 
Okay, so as we scroll down kind of to the bottom half of the page here, we see what looks to be a little more interesting. It's got more of the windows kind of look and feel to it with the tiles. So if we are using payroll and HR, um, we do have a plugin available for people to actually log in and they have a very kind of light slash limited user. It's really an employee self-service user and our employees can log in as an option and enter their time and you'll see I've got some uh, a time card started here that I've started entering my time and of course there's workflow with this that would allow that time to go on and be approved and so forth before it goes to payroll but um, the employee self-service person can also update their direct deposit information so if they're adding a bank account or maybe they want to split they've opened a holiday savings or something and they want to split this off uh, they can make their changes here and again there's workflow that sends that on so someone approves it before it's final uh, maybe the employee is uh, sitting at the bank on a Saturday afternoon and trying to buy a car and they need their last couple of w-2s or pay stubs and so uh, here I see my w-2 um, statement and so I could log in I'll think about doing this from your phone so you could actually launch the the web client from your telephone from your iPhone and uh, log in grab your w2 from last year and uh, have a nice uh, image of that and maybe either uh, send that directly to the bank officer here and uh, of course you do that in PDF and I do have a PDF creator installed I'm actually using Adobe and so the PDF option lights up for me to create a PDF from the report and uh, email that right out and in a few minutes then uh, you know your loans ready to be approved hopefully um, if you need to reprint your pay stub or you just need to take a look at your pay stub all of your payroll information is automatically populated here and of course this assumes we're doing payroll inside of Dynamics GP but if I want a, a copy of my pay stub or need to go look at it uh, I can do that here and there's a reprint of the stub and of course the same thing I could email that out to someone or if I'm at home and I just want to print that off uh, any printer that my computer can see network or home office or uh, you know the office across the, the globe uh, any printer that Windows can see is available here I can select that and get a hard copy of it if I need it and so that's kind of designed for employees to be somewhat self-sufficient and um, take some of the the um, mundane tasks so to speak off of the payroll and HR folks um, the uh, procurement area is kind of next and so we do have uh, a purchase requisition system in here and you'll see requisitions that I have started in different stages of each requisition some of these have been purchased because there's a PO number there and so when they say completed and there's a PO number um, then, then that's good news that means that the requisition has gone through all the different levels of approval that have been set up and um, it, it got to the point where a PO was issued and I should be expecting my products here, or my supplies, whatever it might be, anytime. Some have uh, rejected, so they're not going anywhere. And here's one that has been completed, but it hasn't been purchased. So if I'm waiting on the things from my requisition number seven, um, I might want to uh, find out uh, where purchasing is with that. So the boss approved it, but um, but purchasing hasn't released the PO yet. And you'll notice here that you can drill down and uh, take a look at any of these PO requisitions. And so uh, that's uh, easily done. I've got one saved here. So let's drill down on that one and see what we've got. And of course, this is going to take me to a list of requisitions and there it is number 15 there's only one and so from the list and you know in, in the real world you might have more than just one in there you might have a whole bunch and so you might have a big list of requisitions that you're dealing with so here I can see kind of a synopsis of what's on that PO rec and this was mine this is one that I I started and I've saved it I haven't submitted it yet for approval so it's still available here for me to work on uh, and so well let's do that so if I drill down on it I can see here uh, the requisition I've uh, started. Now, 
there's not much required, so the system's going to assign it a number and a date, um, and that's pretty much it. We're going to let people kind of freeform this and tell us as much as they know, uh, and it's been uh, not submitted yet. So, well, I'm ready to send this on to the boss, or or it might be ten bosses up the chain that have to approve this. So, based on my uh, setup here, so as we discussed, and uh, comments not required, but I'm going to send that on and hopefully get an approval here. That'll take just a second. This is on my laptop and you can see why we kind of do this on servers and not on little portable computers. So if I go back to 15 now, now we see that, um, there it is. So the workflow status here, if I'm looking at it in the future, is uh, pending approval. Uh, and this is the date and time stamp that um, that it's been sent in. And so, um, well, I'm actually the approver. So since this is a demonstration system, I'm uh, doing my own approvals. And so I'm just going to refresh this page and I should have then that requisition show up. There it is under my workflow tasks. And so as the approver now, uh, I can see that, oh, I'm, somebody sent me a requisition. I need to approve it. Well, you might say, yes, but my approvers are not otherwise in the accounting software. And, and you're right. Uh, I would say this is an exception. Most of the time, if not all the time, but many times the approvals actually go out through email and they send an email email out to the approver or the first approver and and that approver can take action accept it they can that will approve it they can reject it or they could delegate that on to someone else and so uh, here I can uh, come in now so I'm playing the approver and normally I would do this in an email I the approver would not at all be required to log into the system um, but the, the email piece is a little harder to set up when there, when this isn't a live system. And so I'm kind of doing it and simulating the the uh, initiator, so the requester and then the approver, if both of them are me. And they would, through the email then, have these three buttons that they could accept, uh, they could approve it and reject it or delegate it. And so uh, uh, I can uh, approve this and so, um, I can put a comment here if I want to as well, but it's not required. So I'll just say OK and mark it approved. And at that point, then it's available to uh, go on to the next level. So if there's someone above me that has to approve this or two people above me, the workflow continues and, and finds all of the approvers based on my setup that are required. And, uh, and, and it travels through that path once it's final approved, then it can be purchased. And, and this one is final approved. So at this point, I could actually come in now. So now I am an accounting user. So now I am a Microsoft Dynamics GP user, and I can actually create a purchase order here um, uh, right from the requisition. And, you know, I can, uh, uh, the, the, requ the requester actually selected the vendor. Well, maybe I'm gonna change the vendor. Maybe I'm gonna change, or in this case, add the shipping method. I see what's on uh, the requisition itself, and this is just showing me that this purchase order is going to be tied to this requisition, and so all those approvals and so forth uh, will will be seen then uh, in years going forward. So we'll never have to wonder, well, who authorized that? You know, who bought that? Well, we'll know if we decide to use this part of the system. Um, sometimes I'm, I didn't actually do the purchase order, but sometimes we want just a, a printout of the requisition. And so we can, from the requisition, we can actually just print something. It's not a fancy document because this is all designed to be electronic, but if for some reason we needed just to get something on paper or to send this out uh, in an email, we have that ability as well. And so, um, so that's kind of a quick, uh, overview of the requisition system. Um, the uh, kind of the last area uh, here is the Power BI. And so you might have heard about Power BI. That's kind of Microsoft's new reporting tool. And they have built hooks into GP already for Power BI. And so, uh, and this does take a, a couple of seconds to populate because it's coming from a live website. And so I've created a couple of reports here, a customer profit report that I have access to and uh, kind of a vendor report. And while that's uh, kind of thinking, I'm going to open Power BI on my desktop 
and so you can see kind of where this work is done. And let me get this over here. And so this is the Power BI uh, desktop uh, application. And so uh, here you'll see I've got, there's my customer profit report that you saw for a few seconds there inside of my GP. And again, this uh, you see a little bit of a lag here because this is actually stored in the Microsoft Cloud and I'm retrieving it through this desktop application from the, the Microsoft Cloud site. And so uh, this is not data that's stored on my, uh, my C drive, so to speak. And so I just created a, a quick customer report here. And so, um, and, and you know, this stuff you're just picking from a list. And so you see over here all the different fields uh, in this particular view that I've connected to from my data. And of course, if that sounds foreign, that stuff we help you with or, or your IT folks can do, but this is the training that we provide. The reporting itself is pretty simple. Uh, a lot of times it's, you know, where to get the data is the hard part and, and that's what we uh, help you with. And so, um, I'll make that a little bigger. Well, if I want to add, I'll just grab this first one here for um, ease. If I want to add the ABC code of the item, so I'm selling items here and my items are broken down into my best sellers, kind of my moderately good sellers, and then kind of my dog, so to speak, so to speak my C sellers. Um, and, and those could be that I don't sell a lot or they're, they're not very high margin and you know maybe I carry them because I'm expected to or I have to, but uh, I make most of my money off my A's. And so with one click, I just added the ABC code to the report, but then I might wanna filter on that. So I can come back over here to filters and um, you know, if I want to see, luckily I have a lot of A's, so I, I only have one C here that's uh, not a good seller, so that's good. That's the beauty of sample data. Um, and so, you know, I can get a list here of just my A um, sellers. I might want to look at those that don't have an ABC code for whatever reason. So I might need to go back into my accounting data and uh, take a look at this and add that ABC code um, so that then my report's more meaningful. And so um, uh, we don't have time to kind of go through how the reports are built, but you can see that those reports are available uh, to be plugged into your homepage. And uh, Microsoft has built uh, for Dynamics GP some nice dashboards. There's one for financial, one for sales, one for purchasing, and one for inventory. I pulled the sales dashboard onto my homepage here. And so uh, I haven't modified this in any way, shape, or form. I simply downloaded it from Microsoft and plugged it into GP. And so um, uh, lots of these free tools that they have available, we can just go grab. Of course, we can edit anything they've done. So if we don't like these graphs or we wanna change up something, these are just, uh, they're fully functional, but they're just kind of to get us started. But, uh, you know, we don't have to use things the way that they have uh, uh, prepared them. And so let me go back to the desktop application here. And uh, as I do that, I've grabbed that downloaded pack from Microsoft. And that's going to open on my other screen here. And so this will pull in in just a few seconds here, all four of the uh, dashboards. I've only got one plugged into my GP just because it does bog the system down a little bit because I'm running on a laptop. Need a little bit more horsepower for these. Uh, and so here, you know, is my, that's my uh, sales dashboard. And so if I want to see uh, sales information by year, or of course, you know, I can um, put some slicers in here, much like I did in GP where I put date ranges and so forth. So lots and lots of power in Power BI. Um, and by the way, what you're seeing here is free. So there is a paid version and a paid version is necessary if I wanna share these out. So I can build these and look at them, but if I build them and I want other people to look at them, then I have to pay. And, and the paid version is only $9.99 a month. So that's $9.99 a month. So 10 bucks a month um, if for the paid version. Um, but what you're seeing here that I've done is the free version. And so lots of things available for us and lots of ways to look at data. Uh, Microsoft knows that we all kind of work and, and respond to different things. And so they're not trying to kind of force us into um, you know, doing things their way. They, they give us enough tools that, um, that we can kind of adapt 
at least one of those to ourselves and and so uh, we're not uh, we're not all uh, we don't all have to do the same thing to get to the same result and so um, and um, there there are dashboards also available um, off the menu inside of Dynamics GP and so uh, here's the financial dashboard so this is in addition to Power BI where I've got some raw data that comes out that I can get to like revenue and cost and uh, my operating expenses and so forth and of course just using native Excel functionality um, you know I've got mine set to quarterly but native Excel tools here I can change this up um, and this is not meant to be a, a gap style financial statement but if I want to see my um, financial data based on these quarters or if I flip that to years or days or whatever you'll see those graphs changing uh, very quickly as the data is refreshed from the database. And so, um, Caitlin, we're getting almost at the top of the hour here. Any questions in there uh, in the queue before we go on? Yeah, as yes, Spring, we have a, a okay. couple questions that came in. So right. the first question is, are there reporting options for workflows? Yeah, so good question. Uh, in, in GP 2018, there, Microsoft did build kind of an audit trail or an edit list for workflows. So if your auditors or the boss wants to see, you know, who approved this, um, well, you can print a report of the, the workflow for any transaction that went through it. Um, you can print the direction it went, who approved it, and what those comments were, and so forth. And so, yes, you can. Okay, and then the final question that we had, is there any functionality difference between a Dynamics GP solution that's hosted on-premise versus one that's hosted, say, in the cloud or um, not on-premise? Oh, that's another great question that we hear a lot. Nope, it's the exact same software regardless of where you put it. If you put it on your own servers, if you put it in a private cloud, if you have a data center you work with already and you want it hosted from them or if you want Microsoft to host it in their Azure cloud it's the exact same software and the exact same functionality so there's no difference whatsoever so great question perfect looks like there's no additional questions but if any later questions do come up please feel free to reach out to either Brian or myself you'll be seeing a follow-up email from us this afternoon with the link to the recording uh, and thank you all for joining us for attending this presentation. And thank you, Brian, for giving us this great overview on Dynamics GP 2018. All right. Thank you all. Bye, Caitlin. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.